all please stand? seated. Thank you so much. On behalf of the family, I want to thank you for being here this afternoon. It's not often you have a memorial on a Sunday, but I think it's appropriate because we're going to worship the Lord together and we're going to celebrate God's goodness. And so thank you for coming to uh, celebrate with us today, celebrate with the family. I know it means a lot to have so many here to encourage them and and I know they appreciate all the cards and the calls and the visits. I know they have been visited, and that is wonderful. Uh, to just show uh, love and support right now is so, so very important. And let me encourage you to keep it, keep it up, keep doing that. Because uh, I know in the days ahead, there are going to be some good days, and there are going to be some hard days, and they're going to need to know they still have brothers and sisters that are going to wrap an arm around them and, and give them a hug and say, hey, I love you. And, uh, and God is going to get you through this. So thank you guys for, for being here to support them today. Ken loved the Lord, and we have some objectives today that we want to accomplish. We want to celebrate his life. We want to celebrate the Lord and his faithfulness to Ken. We want to celebrate Ken's walk with the Lord, because I think there are some things that we can learn for our lives here right now as to how to walk with the Lord. And I prayed and prayed and prayed over what to share uh, during the message. And I, I believe uh, very confidently that the Lord led me to a passage that I think will remind us of something Ken would say to all of us this afternoon. Um, got the chance to visit with, a Ken, with Ken and Maureen a lot the last several weeks. And uh, I'll just tell you this. Um, if you want to learn how to walk through days like this that are difficult when you know you're getting ready to say goodbye or see you soon uh, to a loved one, uh, Ken and Maureen uh, could teach us a, a lesson on how to do that with grace and peace and joy. I was with Ken on Thursday. We had to leave to go to a mission trip this last week, and I was with Ken. Brother Guy and I were with Ken on Thursday before we left for the trip. And uh, I will always hold on to the fact that the last uh, vision I got of Ken was a smile when I patted him on the shoulder. Uh, he demonstrated joy in the midst of all of this storm. That is a wonderful lesson to us. He knew who his Lord was. And he was going to look to the Lord uh, through all these many years of his cancer battle and he was going to honor the Lord, and he was going to celebrate the Lord. And so he would want us today to, to, to weep. We know we're going to do that, but he would want us to do it with joy and in confidence in who the Lord is. And uh, one of those unique things uh, in our day and age 
is uh, Ken sang in our choir. You can see his choir robe up here. He sang in our choir for many, many, many years. And one of his favorite songs was Thou, O Lord. And after I pray, we're going to uh, hear our choir through recording sing Thou, O Lord. And if you listen closely, you might hear Ken's voice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just who you are. Lord, your promises are sure. Your faithfulness endures forever. And so, Lord, we come to you today uh, celebrating your goodness and your grace to Ken. And we thank you, Lord, for his life. We thank you, Lord, for the example that he has left to us. And I pray, Lord, for every single one of us in this room that we would bow our hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus Christ like Ken did, and we would just strive to follow. Lord, your love is perfect, and I know you love this family, and I know you're going to provide the comfort and the strength that they need, and so we just ask that, Lord, today you would cover them with your goodness and your grace and your peace, and then they would continue to look to you in the days ahead. Lord, we know you are our life and our strength and our light, and we look to you today. We pray all these things in your great name. Amen.
working it out where we could have the video on that, not just the audio. That's amazing. Family has written out some thoughts that they, they wanted shared today with you. And then here in just a minute, I'm going to um, invite Spencer and Jason to come up and share some thoughts about their dad because they can do a much better job at it than I can. Um, but I want you to think about Ken and just think about his life for a minute as I take a few moments here. It says, Frank Kenneth Coates, Jr., 76, of Ponca City, passed away on June 24th after a 19-year battle with cancer. Ken was born on July 23rd, 1946, to Frank Kenneth and Mary Lockwood Coates in Ada, Oklahoma. And after Ken graduated from Tonkawa High School in 1964, he studied industrial arts education at Northern Oklahoma College, where he obtained his associate degree and then began his studies at Oklahoma State University. And I know we have some OSU grads and fans in the room. Apologies to you Sooners, but Ken was unashamedly OSU. Um, after graduating with a bachelor's degree in industrial art education from OSU in 1968, he enlisted in the Navy, and he was stationed in San Diego, California, Millington, Millington Tennessee, and honorably discharged in Beeville, Texas. Ken was very proud um, of his service. He was very thankful for the opportunity that he had to serve in the military, and um, at every opportunity he got, he would share his thoughts and his stories about that. Uh, it, was, it was a joy to hear him talk about flight school and all those different things and opportunities that he got to be a part of in the military. Um, that, was, that was pretty fantastic, listening to Ken share about his time. Ken started his teaching career in 1972 in Beaver, Oklahoma, where he taught industrial arts and photography for 21 years. While in Beaver, he started the high school tennis program, and they were one of the smallest schools in Oklahoma to have a tennis program with both the girls and the boys, and uh, he was very thankful for that opportunity. He, uh, that kick-started his 32 years of coaching. Amidst his teaching career, Ken pursued a higher education degree, earning his Master of Science degree in 1977. Later, after moving to Ponca City, he taught for an, an additional 10 years in Cedarvale, Kansas. I believe one of his former students was the principal there, and uh, they, he asked Ken to come and teach and uh, coach tennis. In 1966, that was a life-changing year in Ken Coates' life. You want to know why? Because he started dating the love of his life, Maureen Maxson, and they married in September of 1967 in Ponca City. And I believe, if I can remember correctly, you guys had only been dating a few times, and you guys were at a picnic somewhere, and Ken said something along these lines. I probably don't have it exactly right, but you'll get the gist. Hey, you want to just do this for a lifetime? Something along those lines. And uh, Maureen was like, sure. So, and it stuck. Ken and Maureen went on to have two sons, Spencer Kenneth Coates and Jason, uh, Jason James Coates. In 2006, Ken retired and spent his time continuing to coach tennis and volunteering for Habitat for Humanity along with pursuing his lifelong dream of traveling throughout the world. And they got the opportunity to do that, and I know they were thankful for that. Uh, traveling was one of their, their joys in life. Uh, they had lots of fun stories to share about overseas trips with some of the folks here in the church and, and uh, just all kinds of creative ways. And I will tell the men in the room, uh, Maureen can probably help us out. She probably has a list of all the creative ways that... Uh, that these two lovebirds dated each other over the years. So, guys, if we want to step up our game, let me encourage you, go talk to Maureen. There's a good long list of how Ken did it. Because he said this to me one day while we were sitting there at the house. Um, he, he said this phrase. Brother Pete was with me. He said, I said I do, and I meant it. And that changed everything. 
So he meant, he meant it, and, and it changed how he treated his wife, how he loved his wife, how he continued to date and pursue his wife. And so let me just say that as a word of encouragement to all the married folks in the room. Ken was preceded in death by his father, Frank Coates Sr., his mother, Mary Haney, a brother, Francis Henry Hank Coates, his stepfather, Wendell Haney, and a daughter-in-law, Allison Richardson Coates. He is survived by his lovely bride of 55 years, Maureen Maxson Coates of Ponca City, son Spencer and his wife, Jennifer Coates of Prosper, Texas, son Jason of Tulsa, a brother, Randy Coates of Tonkawa, and four granddaughters, Ellis Coates, Megan Royster, Jillian Royster, and Caroline Coates. Now, before I hand it over to uh, Spencer and Jason, I want to share a passage that was important to Ken. This was, I believe, highlighted in his Bible. It's Isaiah chapter 40. Many of you know it. But verses 28 through 31 say this. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let me just say, Ken waited on the Lord. He intertwined his life with the Lord. And we all know that in these last few years, physically, his body wasted away. But the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful. Amen? He is faithful. He keeps his promises. Ken is, his strength has been renewed. He is running and not weary he is walking and not faint, and he's doing all of those things in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise the Lord and thank him for that. I'm going to invite Spencer and Jason to come up. First of all, on behalf of my, my mom and my brother and all of my family, thank you guys for being here. If you're here, you knew how much you meant to him. And even if you didn't, I want to let you know you meant a lot to him. But if we haven't met, I'm Spencer Coates. I'm proud to say that Ken Coates is my dad. A few, few years ago, knowing that his cancer was determined to be hanging around, I bought him this book. It's called Your Father's Story. You find it at Barnes & Noble, I'm sure, all over Amazon, but it's filled with pages of questions, lots of spaces where he could essentially tell me stories of his own life, pass on to me his wisdom and perspective on fatherhood. Well, knowing my dad well, and if you knew him well, obviously, you likely know that if there's anyone out there that would want to speak at his own funeral, it's Ken Coates. <laughs> so I decided to pull out the book, let my dad speak for himself today. So here's a few things my dad wanted me to know. The book asks, what lessons did you learn about money? He said, well, don't eat out often. It's cheaper to fix some things yourself, and don't buy a BMW on a Dodge budget. <laughs> so by the way, once he finally was off the Dodge budget and he was able to buy a BMW, he loved it so much that he kept the key even after it was totaled in an accident, so that's just him. So the book also asks, what did his parents teach him that turned out to be important to him? He answered, honesty, responsibility, take care of your family, be a good employee, contribute to your community. And looking back at my dad's life, he took those lessons to heart, modeled all of those things well for me and Jason. He kept his straightforwardness and humor in the book too. The book asks, did you always know you wanted to become a dad? He answered, I just always assumed I would be a dad, and besides, you need someone to blame when you can't find your tools. I'm really not so sure about the last part. I can't say that that was an issue with us. I, I mean, that's the story I'm sticking with. So, so similar to the questions in the book, the first year I became a dad, my wife Jennifer had asked me, and what's one thing you learned from your dad, from your own dad, that has just really stuck with you? 
So I just sat there for a while. I kind of thought through all the little phrases that he would predictably say thousands of times. And such as like at the end of a meal, instead of saying he was full, he would have to say he's sufficiently satiated. Or instead of saying something was like something else, he would say it's a reasonable facsimile thereof. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anybody probably in this room that hasn't heard him say that one, you know. So, but all of the things you knew he would say because he said them thousands of times, but you know, you would be disappointed if he didn't. He'd be like waiting for the punchline of a joke, you knew it was coming. So, but anyway, so thinking back all of those things that he would say, I kind of came to one, I kind of chose my answer and I said, move things around. You know, that's the fatherly advice from my dad that really stuck with me. You know, like when we were kids running late, we couldn't find our shoes. He would say, move things around. You know, I can't find something in the shed. Well, move things around. So that always seemed to be what he said a lot. So that's the words of wisdom that, that I remembered most, you know. So two final things that he had written in the book that I wanted to mention. He said that I should never forget how lucky and blessed my life has been, despite some of the negatives. And the thing I can expect out of life as I grow older is opportunities. So as we all remember my dad today, when you're presented with those opportunities, don't just stand in the middle of the room and expect things to come to you. Move things around until you find what you're looking for, or a reasonable facsimile thereof. <laughs> I'm gonna have to try to keep this light so I can get through it. Um, I asked my brother to send me uh, what he wrote so we wouldn't hit all the same points. And it's a good thing because I was gonna say the exact same thing word for word. <laughs> Figured I'd let him do it. I did try to think about what my dad liked to talk about, what he was proud of, what made him different. So here's some bullet points. He was proud of his education. He was told in high school that he was too dumb to go to college. He ended up with a master's degree from OSU. He accomplished this through years of overachieving. He loved sports, played football in high school, started and coached the tennis program in Beaver, and spent the 80s on the ski slopes of New Mexico and Colorado. If he was awake, he was moving. And if any of you were lucky enough to go uh, skiing with him, you saw the look on his face and you knew that was one of his happy places. He was a storyteller. Ken Coates loved to talk. This came in handy being a teacher and a coach, but when he wasn't doing that, he usually cornered someone in the grocery store. <laughs> My mom learned over the years not to worry if dad hadn't turned up on time. He was probably wrapping up a 30-minute dissertation to a random stranger at Walmart. <laughs> he was a hard worker. No one outworked my dad. Summer work, side jobs, extra jobs for the school, all to support his family. He forced, I mean, he taught my brother and I how to work hard when we were kids, <laughs> mowing lawns, roofing houses, building decks. Working hard was important to him. He had a great set of legs. He, he would just want to make sure that everyone was aware of that. <laughs> he put his family first. Aside from all the, <clears throat> aside from all the hard work, he made sacrifices for us without making a big deal about it. Spencer and I used to tease him about his out of style fashion choices when we were teenagers. Years later, it hit me that the reason he didn't have a lot of money to spend on new clothes was because he had spent it all on us. He put the needs of his wife and kids ahead of his own. He loved to teach. He didn't originally set out to be a teacher, but once he set on that path, he never stopped. I think he was good at it because he liked helping people, and what's better than helping somebody learn? He had a great backhand. He drove through the ball really flat, so instead of it kicking up off the court, it just kind of skipped low. In his prime, if he caught his backhand, you weren't getting your racket on it. I know for a fact he would love that everyone here is now reflecting on his backhand. <laughs> I honestly started this list as a way to brag about my dad and the kind of man he was. But as I go over it, I'm realizing that he is still teaching us. Take education seriously, teach and help, 
work hard, stay active, and put your family first. I always felt sorry for my mom being in a house of all guys. Now it's just my brother and I in a family full of all women, so the future looks terrifying. <laughs> but I'm sure if we follow his example, everything is going to work out fine. Love you, Dad. Well, Ken loved to sing, although I never could get him to sing a solo. He always said, I'll sing solo, no one can hear me. And if you watch that video, he was all the way on the end uh, singing Thou, O Lord, one of his favorite songs. So what do you say we sing in his honor? He's asked Donita and I to do the stanzas and y'all to help us on the chorus. So the chorus is one of those echo things. I'll sing the first phrase and y'all will know what to do, all right? Stand with me and let's sing it together. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. Families put together a video of Ken's uh, life that they'd like you to watch, so uh, you follow along. Thank you. 
awesome. I want to thank Spencer and Jason again for sharing. That was beautiful. And uh, I thought of one thing that I would have shared in my time with the obituary. Uh, those of you who are members at Northeast Baptist Church, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say this. We have a practice of having our deacons lead an offertory prayer every Sunday, and they do it on a rotation basis. And so every time Ken had his opportunity to lead the church in prayer, he always started every prayer time with what phrase? Good morning, Lord. And I thought about that this week, and I thought of that old Gaither song, and it goes like this. It starts off and it says, Well, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven, when you stroll down the Golden Avenue. There are mansions left and right, and you thrill to every sight, and the saints are always smiling, saying, How do you do? Oh, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven, when you realize your worried days in, are through. You'll be glad you were not idle, took time to read your Bible. It's a great morning for you. And I can picture Ken on Saturday afternoon greeting the Lord in heaven. Good morning, Lord. I told you I believe the Lord led me to a passage that I think he wants us to think about this afternoon. It's one that I may, I don't think I've ever preached at a memorial service before, but it's found in 1 Kings chapter 2, and those of you who can, he liked to share his thoughts, he liked to share his opinions, he liked to teach, he was a teacher at heart, and so he liked to share the things that were important to him, and he, he was not shy about doing that. How many editorials did he write to the paper over the years? Uh, probably too many to count, because he felt like the things that he had learned from the Lord were important to share with everybody. And so as I prayed about Ken's life and his example, and, and just wanting to share a word from Scripture for us, because we need to understand some things this, this afternoon. I believe God led me to 1 Kings chapter 2, and it says this in verses 1 through 3. Said when, it says, When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, And I can picture Ken over the last several weeks. Every time I would go to visit him, he had some specific things he wanted to share. He shared some specific things with his family, I am sure. And so I want you to envision David as his time is also drawing near. And here's what he said was important. Here's what he wanted his family to grab a hold of. And I believe if Ken were here to talk to us today, he would say some of the same things. Listen to what David said to his son Solomon. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways. And keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Now, I want you to envision Ken as that instructor teacher. Can you picture him today standing before us and saying, Look, I need you to understand. I want you to be strong. I want you to show yourself a man. What does that mean to David? What would that mean to Ken? I think it's in these things that he lays out before Solomon. He says, Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walk in his ways. If we want life to be life the way it was intended to be this afternoon, we have to understand we were created to walk in God's ways. We were created to keep the Lord's statutes and to keep his commandments, to keep his testimonies. And there's a so that at the end of this passage, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. I believe Ken would say to his sweet 
family today. I want you to prosper in all that you do, wherever you turn. And the way to do that is to walk in the ways of the Lord, to keep his word, to keep his commandments, to keep his testimonies. And I believe he would say the same thing to every single one of us in this room. Keep the ways of the Lord. In Psalm 128, God's word says this, and I think we need to pay attention to it this afternoon. It says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. There is blessing when we walk with the Lord. What, what blessing is the Lord? What does he want us to experience? He wants us to experience all of his love, joy, peace, his grace, his mercy, forgiveness, the security that the Lord brings. He wants us to experience hope and life and wisdom. He wants us to experience help and strength and self-control. He wants us to experience his daily presence with us. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you're walking in the ways of the Lord, you're going to experience his daily presence. Or you're going to experience his daily peace. And for everyone who fears the Lord, what does that even mean? It means to respect and to reverence, to, to hold in awe, to esteem, to see the Lord as precious and powerful, to see the Lord as, as your everything. Ken made that the aim of his life, that he would, he would fear the Lord. He would honor the Lord. He would strive. He didn't do it perfectly. He'd be the first one to stand up here and, and say that. I didn't follow the Lord perfectly, but every day I woke up from the time that I understood who Jesus Christ was as my Savior and my Lord, I wanted to keep his ways. I wanted to walk in his ways. What, is that, what does that mean? Do you understand today that God has a way that he does things? God has a way that he does things, and because of that, there's a way that we're supposed to do things. Do we understand this afternoon that we're supposed to love like the Lord loves? That we're supposed to forgive like the Lord forgives? We're supposed to help like the Lord helps? There's a way of life to walk in, and it's centered around understanding that we were created to display God's character to live out God's character, and to follow his commands. There is blessing when we see the Lord for who he is, and we follow his path, and we surrender our lives to follow him. There is blessing in following the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only does God have a way for us to live life, but we need to understand that the Bible tells us God's way to do life is perfect. In Psalm 18, 30, listen to what it says. It says, This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. Did you hear that? God, His way is perfect. Now, let's talk about perfection just for a second, okay? Because I think Ken can help us here. God's way is perfect. You can't get any better than perfect, right? Are you all with me? You can't get any better than perfect. Now, Ken was a teacher. He understood this idea of instructions and doing things just the way that you're supposed to do them. As an industrial arts teacher, you don't build the things that Ken built without following some instructions and doing things in a certain way. Are you with me? And I'm sure if there are any, uh, any of Ken's former students in the room, you understood very, very, very clearly that this is how you do it. I can, I can picture Ken as a teacher in those industrial arts classes saying, okay, step one, step two, step three. This is how you do it. Use the saw, measure, measure twice, cut once. Okay, yeah, just make sure, okay. All right? This is how you use the glue. This is how you use the hammer. This is how you do it. If you want to build this table over here, if you want to build this cabinet over here, these are the instructions. Now, just true transparency, Ken would not have loved having me in his industrial arts class. 
it would not have gone very well. Uh, I can't build to save my life, and I'm not real good at following instructions. But here's the thing. Just maybe, just maybe, if you followed all of the instructions that Ken laid out, you might get a perfect score, right? You might get a perfect score. Folks, we need to understand this afternoon, God's way is perfect. His word proves true. But there's a problem that that verse really highlights. We never, not any one of us in this room, have ever followed God's word perfectly. We never have. And so the problem is, we want to do things our way rather than God's way. And that, that, that nature within us has led us away from the Lord. But God's not satisfied that we stay separated from Him. And we get bent on our own way. In fact, Proverbs 14, 12 says this. It says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way. My way seems right. But if it's not God's way, it's not going to get me where I need to go. And that is, the, that is the definition of how we figure out th this, this thing called life. God has a way for us to live. And we haven't lived it out according to God's plan. We've lived it out according to our own plan. But isn't it amazing that God loves us so much that he sent one, and his name is Jesus, he sent Jesus who lived God's way perfectly. He lived the perfect obedience of the Lord that we could not live. And he died on a cross, a death that you and I deserved. And then he rose again victoriously from the grave three days later after that crucifixion to provide forgiveness of sin once and for all who all will trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus himself said to us in the book of John, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Ken came in his life to understand the truth of that statement. And he trusted Jesus Christ as his way of life. He trusted Jesus Christ that God's word proves true. And he was going to live according to God's word. And he trusted Jesus Christ to take Ken from death to life, everlasting life. And Ken is celebrating with his Savior, Jesus Christ, right now. And we can have that same assurance. And if you're in this room this afternoon... And you have never, ever trusted in Jesus. Let me tell you, He is Lord. He is trustworthy. He will forgive any and all sin. His grace is never-ending. And I would encourage you to bow your heart and your life. Stop doing life your way and do life the Lord's way. And in that way, you can know, just like Ken knew, that the day you breathed your last... You step into the presence and the joy of the Lord, and you can also say, Good morning, Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you this afternoon, and we thank you so much for the truth of your word, that, Lord Jesus, in you there is hope that never fails. In you there is eternal life. In you there is eternal joy, eternal peace. And so we, we declare today that we're going to trust in you and we're going to trust in your word and we're going to believe on these promises. And I pray, Lord, again, if there's, no, if there's someone in this room that has never done that, I pray even right now that you would open up their eyes to see you, open up their ears to hear you, and they would believe in you as Savior and Lord. Lord God, I pray that you would provide perfect comfort and peace to the Coates family. 
Lord, we thank you for the legacy of Ken's life, and I pray that they would make it their aim to walk in the same steps of faithfulness that Ken did. God, surround them with your perfect love, we pray in your name. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a military ceremony to honor Ken's service.
before we dismiss this afternoon, um, we're going to show one other video. And it's one last way for us to worship the Lord together. And then as soon as the video is done, we're going to dismiss the family to the foyer. And, and then we'll dismiss you all. And you can, we're welcome to visit with them before you leave. But I want to thank you again. Thank you all for being here to support them, to pray with them, encourage them. And I know they greatly appreciate it. So you watch the video as a way to worship the Lord. It's a video of Maureen singing in the garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane.
dismissed. <laughs>